Uh, okay, good morning. So uh, it's, uh, it's probably time to start. So today we are very happy to have uh, Professor Ryo Yokoda uh, from Tokyo Tech uh, to give us a series of uh, lectures. So uh, in these lectures, Professor Yokoda will basically cover the fast multiple methods. So actually, uh, Professor Yokoda is definitely the expert in these uh, topics. So uh, he has worked on this field and also the edge matrix uh, algorithm recently. So I, I mean, he has worked in this area for a long time. Uh, Professor Yokoda, he has worked on this um, uh, since his uh, PhD and then in postdoc in UK and uh, US, Boston U, and then he moved to uh, Kaust in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to work on this one. So he made a very famous uh, uh, software called XRFMM, and because of this uh, software, he also won the Golden Bear Prize, uh, which is the top uh, you know, prize in high-performance computing. So this is definitely not an uh, easy thing, and this is a real honor to his uh, excellent work, his FMM. So I think uh, we will be learning a lot from uh, Professor Yukata's uh, lectures, and I think uh, Professor Yukata designed the course quite well. So we have uh, two lectures every day, and then we will have uh, two hands-on sessions so that uh, you know, we can keep uh, our concentration. So two hours lecture and two hours hands-on every day. Okay, so uh, every day after the course, Professor Yokota will like, uh, upload the uh, slides so that you can download that. Okay, so uh, during the lectures, please feel free to ask questions. Okay, so if you, if you prefer to speak in, in Chinese or something, that's okay. I can help to translate that to Professor Yokota. All right, okay, so that's, uh, please join me to welcome Professor Yokota. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Wei Chung, for uh, inviting me to uh, Taiwan. Uh, it's actually not my first time in Taiwan. I've been here a couple of times, but it's my first time to be giving a lecture uh, here. Um, it's also not very uh, common for me. I have given lectures on FMMs before, but not um, such a long one. So this, this one consists of 20 uh, lectures in total. Uh, ten of them will be actual uh, talks like this, and then ten of them will be hands-on sessions. So two each day for uh, the lectures, and then two for the hands-on, and five days in total of um, 20 uh, lectures. And so uh, the first lecture will uh, be on sort of the introduction, what, what the fast multiple method is, and not too much about the details of uh, how it works, or the too, not too much mathematics in the first lecture. And then the next 50 minutes will be uh, on actually a little bit more of the mathematics, so what, what the multiple expansion is. So fast multiple method uses multiple expansions. That's why it's called the fast multiple method. And today we'll learn how to construct these multiple expansions and you know, sort of the underlying theory behind it. And I, I heard um, from Professor Wang that uh, the, you have a, uh, there's a wide variety of uh, levels of the people attending this course. So I will try to make things, keep things very simple. And the math that I will use today is mostly like high school math. There's no advanced uh, skills required to, to understand today's lecture. And also, since it's a very diverse crowd, I won't introduce too many like computer science uh, uh, words or, or you know, notions that you may not understand. So this is a very simple, simplified version of the fast multiple method. And what you'll hear now, we will be in the hands-on session later today, we will actually be coding in the code. So if you listen carefully to the lecture now, uh, this will be better for you because you'll be actually writing 
the code that I'll be explaining now. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, there are many different algorithms. So fast multiple method is just one uh, particular algorithm that uh, does a certain type of um, calculation. But in, in a high performance computing in general, or scientific computing in general, uh, has many different types of algorithms. And each application has its own structure. But you can actually classify these into a few groups. Um, so the, the most uh, historically well-known uh, categorization is where you uh, use this analogy between the seven dwarfs in, in Snow White and um, sort of map them to these seven different algorithms. So the one on the far right, dense linear algebra, is things like dense uh, matrix factorization, so like LU factorization, uh, Cholesky. Sparse linear algebra is where you have many zeros in, in your matrix, and you don't actually have a full matrix. And there are specific algorithms to solve those. Uh, and software. Oh, thank you. And FFT is another well-known algorithm. It's applied in a lot of signal processing applications or even in scientific computing if you use things like spectral methods or pseudo-spectral methods, spectral element methods, and so on. Um, it has a very unique uh, type of communication pattern which makes it difficult to scale on large supercomputers. So before, FFT was like the ultimate algorithm so you wanted to solve everything with FFT, even fluid dynamics. But nowadays, it's becoming very hard to scale that to the largest supercomputers. Um, unstructured grids and structured grids, these are a particular type of uh, meshing techniques when you want to discretize a continuous uh, field of some sort and solve a partial differential equation. Then your discretization leads to either of these types of uh, topologies, and uh, each of them have different ways of optimizing. That's why they are categorized into different bins, although they eventually lead to a sparse matrix which you solve. So uh, it's sort of the, these two methods have to solve sparse linear algebra, but they're categorized separately because uh, they have unique properties. So if it's just some random sparse matrix that doesn't come from these grids, uh, then there's not much you can do to optimize uh, b besides having, uh, you know, very clever storing uh, techniques. But if you knew the underlying topology, the geometry re really helps you to optimize your code. So this is why it's two separate algorithms shown here. Monte Carlo is um, sort of a more statistical, it's less deterministic way of uh, doing a simulation. So I'm showing here as a sort of a histogram of um, these statistical properties. Uh, it, it's sort of used in more, uh, so n-body is used in molecular dynamics, so the, the study of uh, molecular interaction, but before that Monte Carlo methods uh, were used. And so these statistical n-body dynamics methods uh, can be found in many areas of science, uh, you know, from, from the molecular level to uh, the continuum level. And even in astrophysics, uh, you can have different types of n-body methods. So the method I'll be describing today was originally uh, formulated for solving n-body methods. So n-body methods is an algorithm that solves the interaction of n bodies interacting with each other. And uh, it's used in many different applications. So one of the um, most uh, advanced versions of the n body algorithm is this fast multiple method. Uh, so in there, there's this list of top 10 algorithms of the 20th century that was compiled in the year 2000. So um, 
it doesn't include algorithms that were invented after the year 2000, but not too many, uh, you know, like major algorithms have been invented after the year 2000. Uh, it seems that these very famous algorithms like FFT, FMM, uh, Kreloff subspace methods, maybe, so this may sound unfamiliar, unfamiliar to some of you, it's like uh, the CG methods, conjugate gradient methods, uh, or GMRES. They belong to this class of methods. So anything that you use to solve a matrix in an iterative form um, uh, belongs to these class of Kreloff subspace methods. So it's used heavily in many uh, codes. It's like a built-in function in MATLAB. Um, and so you've probably heard of this one, FFT, quicksort. Uh, QR method, QR factorizations. Uh, so you, you have here in 1987, so it's a fairly new algorithm compared to the others, the fast multiple method. So it, it's ranked in one of the top 10 algorithms. And it, there, there's, um, you know, out of these different algorithms, the fast multiple method is sort of, uh, it has very nice features for um, calculating in parallel and very asynchronously on these um, very large supercomputers. So it, it's sort of a nice algorithm for very large uh, supercomputers. Uh, so as a data point for that, I, I want to back up my, back my um, claim that it's good for supercomputers with this typical, well, it's not typical, this, this excellent uh, work that was submitted to the Gordon Bell track on SC14, 2014, um, supercomputing conference, where it was a Gordon Bell finalist, but it, it didn't make the prize. But still, it's an excellent work um, by the group in um, uh, uh, the, well, Leiden. In, in, uh, uh, so this work runs on two of the biggest supercomputers that have GPUs. Uh, this one has, uh, I think, about 6,000 GPUs. And this one has like 16,000 or more, 18,000 GPUs. Yeah, 18,600 GPUs. So Titan is a, one of the largest supercomputers in the world. Uh, I think the number one is China's supercomputer. Uh, too, but Titan is the largest one in the US. And as you can see, this is the speed up you get measured in uh, teraflops, floating point, tera floating point operations per second, as you increase the number of GPUs. So it's, it's like almost scaling perfectly uh, until the whole machine of Titan. And it's very hard to scale like this on Titan because relative to the compute power that the GPUs have, the network is not so um, strong uh, or well connected. Uh, so usually a lot of algorithms have problems scaling to the full uh, machine of Titan, but this one did. And it achieved 24.77 uh, petaflops of mixed precision arithmetic. And so this shows that these types of fast multiple methods or tree codes um, are very good for scaling, very good on GPUs, and uh, you know, sort of work on these future-looking architectures. So supercomputers are mo moving more and more towards uh, machines like Titan. Um, and in the future, algorithms like this will eventually have an advantage as we move to more of these GPU-based or accelerator-based type machines. So this is one example. Um, there are more examples. So I mentioned that the previous slide was showing a Gordon Bell uh, submission. So these are the Gordon Bell Prize winners at the supercomputing conference in 15, 14, 2013, 12, 11, going back. And I'm showing, I'm showing which algorithm was being used inside these methods. So I showed the seven dwarfs. So now I'm showing these best performing application codes of each year and which algorithm they're using. So 
and body methods, the FMM type methods were being used here. This, this one is a very special um, submission. Uh, well, this one and also this one. So the one that starts with David E. Shaw. Uh, David E. Shaw is, um, ha has his own uh, company now that builds special purpose computers for uh, drug design. And he, he used to be a, a professor, but then he went into uh, the field of finance, made a lot of money, and then came back to acad or science and invests in using his private uh, money in these special purpose computers. And he um, has built a computer that is so much more faster than the current state of the art that, you know, it, it sort of has a disruptive effect on the field of molecular dynamics now. Everyone has to be, you know, carefully looking at what they're, these guys are doing because what they're doing is so much more, um, you know, advanced in terms of the duration that they can simulate. So people in the field of molecular dynamics can only simulate up to, you know, like um, microseconds. But these guys can simulate up to milliseconds. That's 1,000 times longer. And note that the um, delta T, the time stepping size for these simulations is like one femtosecond, 10 to the minus 15. So if he's simulating until, you know, 10 to the minus 3 milliseconds, then he's doing like 10 to the 12 number of steps in, in a reasonable amount of time. So that's, that's a crazy amount of um, time steps. And so it's, he, he, he doesn't necessarily solve a huge, huge problem like these other supercomputers do. He solves a reasonable size problem that's useful in drug design and he does it really, really fast. It's like a latency issue that he is solving rather than a scalability issue. And so it's very unique, but it's still an end-body problem. It's molecular, classical molecular dynamics. And uh, these, these submissions also, the one, this is an astrophysical simulation. Um, and also this one is a fluid dynamic simulation done with the end-body method. And this one is uh, both astrophysics and fluids done uh, with an end body. And also this one, again, is the molecular dynamics one. Um, I want to emphasize that the FMM is originally designed for end body, but it can solve these types of um, methods that is currently being solved by sparse linear algebra on structured grids. Uh, the, these, these problems, well, I'll men mention in future um, uh, lectures that the FMM is actually, you, you, th it has a matrix form. So H matrices is like the matrix version uh, of FMM. And if you view FMM as a matrix, then you, it's sort of uh, a nice tool for um, solving these uh, you know, linear algebra problems as well, in order n, and in a scalable way. So um, these methods are currently being solved by sparse linear algebra, but they may be uh, solvable with FMM. So if you look at the potential applications that the FMM can solve, it's almost all of these. So it could be on any Gordon Bell submission if you can have a highly optimized fast multiple method. That's, that's how important this algorithm is, potentially. So the reason why uh, these fast multiple methods uh, work so well on GPUs and, and these uh, other architectures like uh, you know, FX10 or BlueGeneQ um, is because of the number of floating point operations it does per byte that it loads. So in any computer, uh, you have you have the memory, the, the RAM, on your motherboard. The data from the RAM gets loaded into, you know, like the L2, L3 cache, and then the L2 cache, and then L1 cache, and then into the registers, and then it goes into the arithmetic um, units, uh, the transistors that actually do the additions and multiplications. Uh, and it's done, you know, in, like... Um, sort of a hierarchical way. And 
the amount of bytes it can transfer when it goes up these hier memory hierarchy is limited. And if you do more calculations for each data you've loaded, uh, you can get more floating point operations per second out of, your, out of the same chip. In other words, if you load some data and just do one computation on it and then throw it back out, then it's not being utilized. The whole chip is not being utilized very efficiently. And this is a chart that shows that. So it's called the roof line model. And as the operational intensity of your algorithm increases, um, first, your performance increases, but you're still memory bound. But you start from like a very low uh, performance in terms of you know, flops per second. But then you increase until you hit a point where all your arithmetic units are already busy. So even if you load more data, there's no ar arithmetic units that are free. So you can't uh, deliver more floating point operations. So this is like the theoretical limit of the arithmetic operations that you can do per second on a given chip. So you can't do any faster because you don't have enough transistors to crunch numbers anymore. But until you get there, you want to do as many floating point operations per data view you've loaded. And if you look at sparse matrix vector multiplication, it's right here, so this, this dwarf. Stencil code, if you use a high order stencil, maybe here, um, 3D FFT, somewhere around here. Of course, some of these um, numbers here, the exact number that it's showing here, can vary depending on the cast size of the machine because some are sensitive to the, the cast size. Now, for example, actually all of these here are sensitive, are, are um, functions of the cast size. Uh, because the number of flops it does um, the, the, it is sort of asymptotically different from the amount of bytes it needs to load. So the FMM, M2L is a particular kernel inside the FMM. And P2P is also another particular kernel inside the fast multiple method. It has very high flops per byte. Um, so dense matrix matrix multiplication, DGEM, is uh, known as one of the most highly, um, high, uh, most high operational intensity operations that you can do on a computer. So uh, things like the LIMPAC benchmark that people run to benchmark supercomputers and rank the top 500 list, they're full of DGEMs, actually. And, and therefore, that's why you get a very close to theoretical peak performance. But uh, some operations in the FMM have even higher operational intensity than that. So uh, when the trend of future architectures is shifting this sort of point where this thing levels out, this, um, this point at which it levels out is shifting more and more this way. So more and more algorithms are becoming memory bound. If it's on this slope, it's memory bound. And this slope region is shifting this way on future architectures. So um, of course, with, with 3D memory that we have now, stacked memory, um, it, it shifts a little back this way. But um, that, that's a one-time thing. So uh, we, we still have this uh, monotonic trend that uh, uh, the number of flops per byte you want to do is he just keeps increasing. So FMM has the potential to remain compute bound for the longest time in terms of you know what the algorithm can offer. Okay, so now going into what the FMM is, what a tree code is, and what a direct end body method is. So this picture is the simplest way to explain the difference between these three methods. So if you have n bodies interacting with each other, and if you just do it in a very naive way, and loop over all the particles, and then inside that loop, loop over all the particles again, and calculate the interaction between each other, then that creates a double loop of order uh, n, which means it has the n squared algorithm. You can look at the number of lines in this picture. That's the number of computations it needs to do, so order n squared. And then if you can somehow cluster the far points into larger and larger uh, sort of representations, 
then the method becomes n log n. This is called a tree code, like this picture shows. The fast multiple method takes it further and then clusters both sides. So it clusters the, the j particles and both the i particles and creates a tree for both the source side and target side. And so this being order n is uh, very important when n becomes like billions and trillions. Um, so this is the difference between these three methods. I'll be explaining about this one uh, in, in the following lectures. So this is a very high level description of what the FMM is. Um, I'd like to give you a few examples of where it's being used. Um, so in astrophysics, each of these bodies, one point can represent more than one star, like a cluster of stars, but still, you want to calculate the interaction of these galactic um, bodies. So each of them contains a certain amount of mass. You solve the interaction between all those bodies with the gravitational potential. That, that's like a 1 over r, 1 over the distance uh, type function. And then you get a simulation like this. Um, you can see how these clusters of stars form, which in the night sky you see pictures like this. Now, if you have a nice enough camera, you, you want to know, you know how these celestial objects become this shape and this density and this, this size. And to do that, you can actually run a simulation starting from an initial condition that's representative of the uh, beginning of the universe. And then you can see these things form. Uh, there are other um, types of astrophysical simulations where you start out with the initial condition of the galaxy being this shape and then have two of them collide and things like this, which is what the, the previous large run on Titan was doing. It was uh, solving the collision of our galaxy with the Andromeda galaxy. So you can do these kinds of simulations very fast if you have the fast multiple method or tree code. And then it's also used in a very smaller scale for molecules. Each of these atoms are bodies, are, are particles, and they interact with, with each other with a potential that is the same as the gravitational potential. It's the uh, 1 over r type potential. And so to solve this potential field, you solve uh, the interaction of all atoms with all, alum, uh, all atoms. Um, and the electrostatic force is induced from everywhere to everywhere. Every, everyone feels the effect of everyone else. That's why you need to calculate the interaction of all against all. But if you can do that, you can simulate all these water molecules and the protein inside it. And for example, a, a typical application would be if you had a new drug that had a certain um, form, you, you want to see how it docks with certain proteins and so that you can deliver uh, drugs more efficiently or design new types of drugs uh, even without experimenting, because experiments can be very expensive if you do it a million times, but if you do it inside a computer, it's just, it's just the electricity that you need to pay for. So um, at the scales that are too small for people to directly see and to manipulate, or scales that are too big like the you know, galaxies, uh, simulations are very useful because you can't really do too many experiments in, at those very large or very small scales. But with these tools, we can do it uh, in a computer many, many times under different conditions. And so fast multiple method can be used to solve these types of problems too. Uh, a third type of problem is fluid dynamics. Uh, usually, you solve fluid dynamics using a mesh. But you can also solve it using particles. These are a bunch of fluid particles. And you can simulate something that looks, this is a simulated uh, calculation. Um, it, it's in slow motion, so it looks kind of strange, but it's, um, it's actually being calculated by uh, this kind of particle-based uh, fluid dynamics method that calculates splashes by 
splashing particles around. And so this is also interaction of these particles against particles. And for incompressible flows, you need to solve a Poisson's equation, which means it's like the same potential again. It's the one over R type potential. And you can simulate that very fast if you have a fast multiple method. Again, it's everyone interacting against everyone if you want to solve the incompressible um, equations. So this is what mathematically this potential looks like. I've been saying 1 over r, but this is, this is what I meant. So r is the distance between two points, xi and xj. So r, let's write this rij. This is equal to vector xi minus vector xj, which is this arrow here. And you take the norm of that, and uh, you, get, you get the absolute distance as a scalar. And the potential is a function of the inverse of that. And you need to sum for all the j particles inside. But if you look at what one j particle induces, this is 1 over r. So when r is 0, it goes to infinity, and then it rapidly decays. So in, if you plot it in 2D, it looks like this. It's like a peak, peaky mountain uh, like potential and so this is the potential that it induces uh, if you take the gradient of the potential you get the force so you can take the gradient of the this this function here and then you can calculate the force acting on each body and according to the force you can calculate the velocity according to the velocity you can calculate the x at the next time and that's how you progress you you calculate F, you calculate V, you calculate X, and then the new X you use to calculate, again, the new uh, potential, and then the new force. So that's how a typical n-body method proceeds. You calculate, um, you keep incrementing uh, in very small time steps the movement of the points by calculating its force induced on them and moving them according to that force. So. To do that, if you have many, many bodies, you want to calculate them efficiently. So, so here comes the actual, the sort of theoretical part, the beginning of the theoretical part of this uh, lecture. So the first step, what do you do? So assume you have these points here with qj charges, so q is it can be the mass for galaxies or the electrostatic charge for uh, molecules. It's, it's the value that each of these points possesses. So you have a 1 over r potential. So xi minus xj, the distance. Um, and then you multiply the charge to that. And then you sum up all the effects. And then you get the induced potential, uh, ui, at all those points. So consider these as the source points and these as the target points and say that these two are far away. So this one is over here, this one is over here. Uh, they're, they're far enough that you can actually average, well, you can actually sum up all the points Q in this field. So this, this point is actually at the center of this box here, this, this center point. You sum everything to the center and say, I have qj prime uh, charges at the center here. So from this target particle, this whole thing looks blurred, and it looks like one big point that has a charge, qj prime. That's the sum of everything inside here. It looks like one big blob, like shown here. And then you calculate the effect of that qj prime using the two distance between the two centers of these boxes. So this point here is at the center of this target box here. So you're calculating the distance between the two centers, xi prime minus xj prime and the distance. And then you say that is the potential that's induced on roughly this entire area. So what you're saying here is ui prime that's induced here is equal to everything here. W what I'm saying is everyone is feeling roughly the same effect, so I'm just going to substitute ui prime, that's the potential here, to all the values here. They're all the same potential. 
It's a very rough approximation, but when this box is very small, and this box is very small, and these two boxes are very far from each other, it's a rather good approximation. It de it's just a relative issue. It depends on how small this box is compared to the two distances, the, uh, the, the distance of the two. And so if you draw a picture of that, um, you know, the interaction between the two bodies, this actually looks like this. So you're taking all the sources, gathering them into one point, then calculating the interaction between one point against one point here, and then spreading the effect to uh, the other points. This is like the simplest FMM-like method that you can think of. Just average everything in the center, calculate the, this one, only one equation you need to calculate between the two centers, and then say that everything inside the box is equal to what you've calculated here. This is like step one for um, the most basic FMM. So we'll, we'll do the hands-on coding session starting from this one. We'll actually code this and see how good this works. It's going to give you a roughly correct answer. So it's already, you know, quite good. And it's going to work much faster. We're going to compare the speed to calculating everything against everything with this equation and compare that with doing step one, step two, step three. And then we compare this UI, the approximated one, with this UI that we get by directly calculating. We'll com by comparing the two, you can show in the hands-on session the accuracy of this very simple uh, looking FMM-like method. So now we can improve this slightly. Um, well, actually, so here, this was uh, the particles we assumed that would be very far from each other. This is actually not the case. To make it more applicable to a real problem, what we need to do, so usually what we want to do is we have a box full of points and we, cal we want to calculate all the points against all the points and not necessarily the two that are far from each other. So how can we make sure that when we calculate the effect of all the particles in this big box against each other, how can we assure that two are far from each other? Well, the simplest solution is to divide the box into many points and when you're calculating this one, just calculate against these with the approximation. And everything that's close, these ones here, you just calculate with the, uh, you know, the direct interaction calculation here, which is the exact solution. So you only use this approximation if you can um, identify that the boxes are far enough. So you sort of split, well, you need to split it into at least 16 boxes like it's shown here. If you only split until four, everything is still neighbored, so you can't really do the far. So when you split twice, then, then you have these far ones. So at this level, you can actually split into the near and far. So this blue box, I'm just showing for this one, but you actually need to loop over all the boxes and consider them as the blue box and then calculate you know, the appropriate red far boxes and also combine that with the solution of the near boxes. So this is step two, near far decomposition. So in, in the hands-on section session, uh, we'll, we will do, after we finish this one, we will try to code this thing. So what you need to do is you need to divide the domain into like a you know, these small boxes, and then you need to figure out how to um, calculate which box against which box. Uh, if you num number them in a clever way, it's very easy to un identify from that number which ones are far and which ones are near. And if you number these points in a clever way, it's very easy to identify from the number of the box which particles are inside that box. It involves sorting these points uh, so that they are continuous inside each box. Uh, initially, they might be randomly positioned, so you need to sort them so that it goes like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 9, 10, 11, 12. So you, we'll, we'll do this in the hands-on session, how to s organize the points. And then call this one for these point boxes, 
and call this routine for these boxes. And then we need to sum up all the answers that we got here, add them to the ones that we get here, because it's the sum of the near and far. Uh, it's the effect of everything. So it's the effect from all of these and also all of these. So you need to add the answer to the UI at the end. And then we'll compare again against the case where you calculated everything against everything. So uh, it, once we can do this comparison, now this is, uh, you know, it can be applied to a real problem. Now actually, even with this very simple two step, the second step, you can already calculate for a real molecular dynamics simulation a, a very rough answer, but still, you can already calculate something that's close to the answer you want, and it's probably faster than calculating everything against everything directly. Say you had a thousand points, then that's a thousand by a thousand calculation if you do it directly. If you do it this way, you're calculating for a s smaller subset of the points with this one, and this one you're only calculating against two points every time. So it should be much faster, but not so much different because um, you're basically saving, you know, you still need to do this part directly. You're not saving much. Uh, so the problem with this one is that you, you're only decomposing the domain with one level. There's no hierarchy here. So the next step after this one, what's the logical next step to take? Of course, we introduce more levels in the tree. So we have we divide them further and further and, until they become smaller and smaller. So if you have a big, big problem, if you have like a million particles, you can use a technique, just make the tree deeper. And as long as you have a constant number of points at the bottom, at the smallest box, this method is order n. The reason is because when you do this calculation here, if the number of particles per box is constant, regardless of how many you have in total, if you can make the tr tree deep enough, you'll, you can always have a constant number of points at the lowest level of the tree. And you will do order one calculations for each box. You have n boxes at the bottom of the tree. So this is order n. So now think about this stage. When you have many boxes, you calculate at the center the average, and then from each of those averages, you just sum up to get the bigger box average. You do this for as many number of nodes you have in the tree again. So you, for, for any tree, the number of nodes in the tree is still order n. So this calculation here is order n. Now, when you want to calculate the points against each other, you sort of form this hierarchical type of interaction list. So for the points here, you interact the big box against the big box. So, and for, for the smaller ones here, shown in the light green, you calculate against these boxes. And further down the tree, you calculate against these boxes. And then at the bottom, you calculate against the particles against the particles directly. So at each level, think of how many points you're interacting with at each level. It's a constant. So it, this is this many. At this level, it's also a constant. It doesn't depend on n. It's order one number of points. And here, again, it's an order one number of points that you're interacting with. And so it's always order one points that you're interacting with uh, uh, for each node in the tree. How many nodes in the tree do you have? You have order n nodes. So it's order n nodes times order one boxes of interaction. So it's order n times order one means this calculation here is also order n. And going down the tree, it's the same thing. You calculate this against this. This side was order n. So going down, it's the same thing, order n. And when you distribute, again, these points to the ones here, it's again order n because this side was order n, and it's sort of symmetric. So now you know that each stage, step one, two, three, four, five, is order n. So the condition is, if you can make the number of points per you know, smallest box in your tree constant, make the tree deep enough if, when your problem size is large, then this method is 
already uh, order and method. The problem is, you know, it's not very accurate because, you know, you're, you're not doing a very accurate calculation here. You're just summing up the effect. And then here, you're just assuming that everything is equal to the center. So again, you're assuming, you know, say that this point here is i prime prime, and these points here are i prime. You're saying that the effect on this one is equal to these, and the effect on this one is equal to these. So the potential here, all the points inside this big box have equal potential. That's, that's what you're saying. Well, actually, when you start to sum up in the method I described earlier, what you're actually saying is the effect from these points here are the same inside all the points here. But the effects from these points here is not the same for each of these points because you're calculating them directly. So when you sum up the answer from this far field with the near field, uh, you, you get different values for each of these points here because of this side calculation, because you're adding to the answer from here, the answer from here. So when you, when you combine the two answers, each point will have a different number in it because of this side effect. So, so when you actually do the hands-on session coding, today we'll also try to code this one um, where we have a deeper tree. Now, it, it might become a bit tricky how to retrieve the information of these boxes because I haven't described to you how you construct a tree structure in the computer. So um, may, maybe we won't do this deep tree thing uh, in today's hands-on because tomorrow's lecture will actually cover how to make a tree. So um, I'll just introduce to you the notion of uh, a hierarchical decomposition today and maybe not do it in the hands-on session. So, um, but we, we will do it tomorrow for sure. So uh, now the tree looks like this. So you have points here, go to the intermediate level here, which goes to the top level here, and then across, and then goes down the tree. So now we have a multi-level uh, FMM-like algorithm. So this is now almost the FMM. Uh, now we can do the near-far decomposition again uh, for the hierarchical version. So if we do the near-far, we have different types. We have three levels of far decomposition this time. And the near field is only a very small part here. So for the top level, we sum between these the effect on the blue box here. Now, we have all these white boxes that cannot be calculated at this level. These will be handled at this level because the boxes are small enough that these can interact. We can assume that everything inside here and here uh, can interact with this coarse approximation. So we just use smaller boxes to interact with each other. And here, the part that was left out here hasn't been calculated yet. We calculate this part using even smaller boxes. So having a hierarchy of level of boxes actually allows you to cover what has been left from the top. What your parents couldn't do you can do here. What these parents couldn't do, the children can do here in your tree structure. And then at the bottom, there's always a level where you can't go down any deeper. Here, finally, you use the direct interaction with this, this direct kernel here. So by, by combining this technique, again, you have a constant number of points always, although there are many, it's still a constant number of points interacting with each blue box. And you have, in total, in the whole tree, you have order n blue boxes. So it's order n blue boxes times order 1 red boxes. It's an order n calculation, even for um, the hierarchical version. And, well, actually, it has to be the hierarchical version to be order n. Um, and then, if you look at how these boxes, the size of these boxes are being chosen, um, it's sort of like a angle, right? So say, say this box here is touching these two lines. Now, this box here, the corners are touching these two lines. Again, now this box here, the corners are touching these two lines. So you're sort of looking at and deciding 
how uh, small the box should be in the form of an angle. So it, it's like the notion of a parsec in astrophysics. You're looking at, you know, parsec is an angle. It's not an actual distance. You measure, um, you know, celestial bodies um, in parsecs, but it, that's an actually an angle. Um, and so you're, you're, and the reason why that's useful in astrophysics is because the further away they are, the less you have to distinguish them. It's, it's actually a concept that's similar to here. If, they're, if the angle looks similar to you, so basically if they're far away, you can actually group them into bigger groups because to you it makes less difference. So if you're inside this box or inside this box, the, the error of summing them up and considering them as one thing, this error here, of, of approximating everything as one thing and also saying that everything that's acting on this one is the same as the one that's acting on the individuals. This equality here um, is accurate enough if the angle looks the same. So this is the notion of the opening angle in, in, um, when you decide how you interact. Because you, you can actually make the angle narrower to increase the accuracy. So say that you choose the angle to be narrower, what, what happens is, um, uh, well, actually, I, I have a slide in the, for the next lecture. It, it's going to look like this one. So um, I'm sort of jumping into the slide of the next lecture, but uh, just to give you the idea of what happens when you narrow the opening angle, uh, a, nine, a 3 by 3 by 3 neighbor region is now looking like this. It, it gets bigger. Uh, you have more direct interactions to do. And the ones, the boxes that were this big size are now of a smaller size. And this is because you're narrowing the angle. And you can do this gradually. You don't have to immediately go to like 5 by 5 by 5. You can leave out the corners because um, the accuracy of this approximation is sort of a function of the distance from the center. So you want this shape of this region, the dark region to be close to a sphere as possible. You, you don't want it to be a square because the corners will have the largest errors. So you want to sort of chop off the corners when you make this type of um, interaction list. But so it, this one has less approximation but more boxes to calculate. And so it, sh should I strictly follow the time? Yeah, Maybe we can have a 10 minute break? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, because I've already finished, so this is actually in, in for the next slide. Uh, so this was the last slide of my first part. So I should finish here and then start again in 10 minutes. Okay? All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, so this is the second uh, part of today's lecture part. Uh, and um, I'll be talking about a continuation of this morning's uh, lecture. So just to review, let's start again with this very simple version uh, where you have two distant points in the box and you gather everything, you sum everything to the center, you calculate its effect, its potential on a center point here and then you assume that everything is equal. So the question we didn't ask this morning um, in the first lecture was uh, how accurate is the solution when we do this? So how do we, how, how can we make this um, more accurate? Or how can we measure? And of course, you in the hands-on session, it's actually nice to maybe change the distance between these two boxes. It's very easy to just you know add one or something and make this farther away, and see what happens to the the answer because you you will be comparing the direct answer that you obtain by summing everything against everything with this equation, and you compare that with going through step one, step two, and step three, and those two numbers will be different, but um, as you make them further and further away, they'll start becoming the same. And so what 
when you measure that, you'll see that when we separate them more, we get a more accurate solution, of course. So if we do something that looks like, you know, has a larger uh, neighbor region when we do the well-separatedness, then the less approximation we do, uh, it's going to be more accurate, but we have to calculate more boxes, so it's going to be slower. So, of course, there's a trade-off between speed and accuracy, but uh, since we're using only the sum of everything, and here we're assuming that everything is equal inside the box, it's not a very accurate way to calculate. Of course, it's a good first-order approximation. And, um, that word first, approxim first order approximation uh, actually is very precise uh, in, in terms of describing what we're doing here. Um, but we, we will want to achieve better accuracy without having to calculate too many things directly. So what's, what's the way to calculate more accurately? Okay, so suddenly I've introduced a lot of equations in this slide, but don't be afraid. Uh, I'll go through all of them very slowly. And uh, it, it's not showing the bottom part of my yeah. slide, so that, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just show it in this mode, because it's very important that you see everything in this slide. Um, is this too small? Yeah, maybe it's too small. Um, okay, I'm going to do it gradually. So first I'll, even though you can't see this here, I'll, I'll move it up in, in the end when we get here. Okay, so first let's just focus on um, this part here. So, so th this part here that I'm showing here is actually not so different. So I'm going to go back and forth between what changed. Okay, so this is the slide we had in the morning before where we calculate this equation and this equation. When I go to the next slide, see what changes. It, so it's just a definition change. So I, I redefine... I define this thing called xij, which is equal to xi minus xj, and I define this thing called g, xij, which is a function that represents this 1 over uh, xij part. And so when I write this like this, then this here changes to just g times qj. Of course, this is you know, because qj was being multiplied to this thing, this is equal. So, but it's important to write it this way because otherwise this part is going to be very, very long. So I, I've um, introduced an abbreviation for the equation so that this part doesn't become too long. Okay, so that's all I did. I introduced this notion of xij and I introduced this notion of g here. Um, and then this part here can also be written with g, xi prime, j prime, and times qj prime. So this is, and these two parts remain the same. Okay, so now what we do is to achieve higher accuracy, we're instead of just summing up everything and just saying everything is equal, instead of doing these two very crude approximations, we are going to introduce a proper mathematical um, high order expansion based on the concept of Taylor expansion, which you don't see right now very clearly, but uh, I'm going to move this up in a few more minutes. So first, focus on this part here. What I'm doing is I'm saying that xij, the vector that goes from j to i, can be broken down into three vectors, xi to xi prime plus xi prime to xj prime, and then xj prime to j. This is basically saying one big arrow from j to i has been broken down into three arrows of these two. And, you know, it's just vector addition, where if you add the three arrows, it, it becomes you know, what's connected from the end to the beginning. So that's this equality here. And now... We introduce this concept. This is important when applying the Taylor expansion that these two arrows from j to j prime, this one, and i to i prime, 
the sum of these two vectors is smaller than this long vector here. This is a condition for the Taylor expansion to converge. So say that we have these two boxes far enough. Every point in this box is inside this box. So the vector can be at most the longest from here to here. That's the longest maximum. Here also, if the j is at the corner, this is the furthest. It's at least this size. But this arrow here is very long compared to this longest xj prime in j and i prime in i. So we can say that the sum of these two is much smaller than this. Or actually, this is the condition that we need to apply for the following to converge. Now we move to this thing. So I'm going to move up the slide a little bit so that you can see this. Um, okay. So what, what was shown here is a standard Taylor expansion. The function fx can be uh, written as a series of uh, the derivatives of the function uh, f um, with respect to a, some value, when um, subtracted from x gives you uh, a very small number. So this part being small is the important thing here. This, this, if, if this number was larger than 1, then this, because you keep multiplying by n, this number is going to get bigger and bigger. If this is x minus a is smaller than 1, if you keep taking, uh, or taking the power of n, um, then it becomes smaller and smaller, right? So it depends on whether this part is smaller than 1. So, so this part needs to be small for this thing to converge. And so if you, if you think of x as xij, and if a is xi prime, xj prime, uh, ij, i prime, j prime, then x minus a is this minus this, which is according to this equality here. It's the sum of these two things here. And so this part being small, now you see the reason why this had to be small. It's for this Taylor expansion to converge. This part had to be small compared to this part here. And now if you just apply, since Taylor expansion has this power of n, uh, or sorry, uh, factorial of n, uh, you have this here, and then this derivative of f is, is shown in the vector form because we're dealing with uh, not just a 1D um, function here uh, because x is a vector. So in 3D, um, this is also has x, y, and z components. This n will also have x, y, and z components. This uh, nabla here will have x, y, and z components. So it's this n power here is actually like a partial derivative of x, y, and z. But, so when n is 1, it's like partial derivative of x, partial derivative of y, partial derivative of z being applied to g. When n is 2, it's like x, 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 y, x, z, and then y, y, x, y, x, y, y. So it's all of those derivatives. So the number of n just represents the total of the combination of the, the number of derivatives of those uh, different components. So view this as a vector form of the Taylor expansion. That's the simplest way I can put it. Think of this as the 1D Taylor expansion. This one is like a 2D or 3D Taylor expansion. It's the exact same thing here. It's a 3D version of it. But um, so F becomes G, A becomes XI prime J prime, X minus A becomes XI I prime, XJ prime J. Uh, and you know the powers of n's and the factorials of n's are vectors. In 2D, they have two components. In 3D, they have three components. This sum also, this n is also a vector. It has three components, nx, ny, and nz in 3D, and it's summing. But if you sum to infinity, you get the exact answer. So gx is, can be written like this. So this is an important thing you want to remember here. This is a... Um, important change that you made is that G is, can be written using Taylor expansion. This is like high school math, except for that if it's in 2D or 3D, it's more like university math level. But um, it's just Taylor expansion, nothing difficult. You applied Taylor expansion to function G, 
by decomposing xij into these three arrows and saying that these two small arrows are much smaller than this big arrow here. That's all. Just Taylor expansion. And now, I'll, I'll move back the slide because um, I don't want to break the original picture. Oh, um, okay. Now, let's go to this side. So, it's the same equation as here. G and the Taylor expansion, except I change the infinity to a finite number P. So what does this mean? It means I'm just truncating at P because I can't do this on a computer. I can't sum to infinity. On the computer, uh, the, in the actual program, you need to stop at some number P. Um, but the good thing is, if you increase P, even inside your code, you can actually get you know, enough accuracy because it's just controllable. You, if you want more accuracy, you can just keep increasing P and eventually it will get to like, you know, double precision round off error, uh, which the computer can't be more accurate than that anyway. So uh, you just need to increase P until you, you, it's sufficient. Usually in many applications like molecular dynamics or fluid dynamics, astrophysics, you, you don't need that much accuracy. Um, you don't need like the full, you know, 15 or 14 digits of accuracy of double precision. You can actually um, <coughs> get away with maybe 10 or 8 or even 4 digits of accuracy. Then um, <coughs> this equation here, we apply only one more mathematical uh, formula, which is the binomial theorem. This is also high school level math. If you have x plus y uh, to the nth power, this can actually be written in this combinatorial form uh, between x and the you know the the um, product of x and y to these different powers. So it's oh sorry I'm missing a summation here. There should be a summation from uh, like k going from zero to n here. Uh, but the summation is here, so even though this this part is uh, slightly incorrect, this this one is correct. So what we did is we applied this binomial theorem to this part here. So x i i prime plus x j prime j to the nth power can be written as from here, from starting from this summation up to here. So it changed into this this term here. Everything else is the same, as if you can compare with your eyes. This part is the same as this part. This part is the same. But you change this part using the binomial theorem, very simple mathematical theorem, to this part here. It's, it's identical. n power, n minus k uh, factorial, uh, and k factorial, um, you know, x and y are n minus k and k power. So. It's the exact same thing. We just applied this theorem. So this is equal to this. Everyone agrees? OK. So now the rest is even, even simpler math. So we have n factorial here in the numerator and in the denominator. So we just cancel those two. That's this step. Everything else hasn't changed. The next step, we swap the loop order between n and k. So here. We had the summation over n here, but now we switched uh, the order which we do the summation, which has an effect on this because we were summing to up to n here. So if we move this forward, uh, actually we need to change um, the number from n to k going to p because so say that k is zero here, k is zero here. And then you, you are originally summing from 0 to n, uh, which is now, if you take this outside, then if you look at it the other way around, n was going from uh, k to p. So you're actually, this, this part isn't changing. There's nothing on this side that changes. It's just when you swap these two summation orders, um, you, you have to change uh, 
the number which n goes from. It goes now from k to p. Uh, yeah, so think of this as a triangle. It's like a lower triangle summation. So n goes from 0 to p, and k goes from 0 to n. So, so if you view this as like a, you know, in the form of a triangle, it, it's very easy to see this correspondence. Um, it, so when k goes from 0 to p, then now n would look like it's going from uh, k to p because of the triangular effect. If both went from 0 to p, it would be the full square. So it's like a lower triangular loop because this was only going to n, the diagonal component. It wasn't going past the diagonal. But now, since it's not going past the diagonal, you have to start from k. That's, that's the sort of the triangular loop you can think of. OK, now, once you were able to picture that triangle, you can see that these two loops can be swapped. Now, you just redefine n minus k to n. So everything here that was written n minus k is now, so see this n minus k, it turns into n. k, k just remains k. Uh, and the n minus k here turns into n. So if n minus k turns into n, what does n turn into? n turns into n plus k, because basically you're just adding k to to n. So this turns into n plus k. So now it's just a redefinition of variables. Without loss of genera generality, you can do this. So, and we just changed n minus k to n everywhere in this equation. So this whole equation changed to this one. Now we're almost at the end. And the end is significant. But um, again, you can't see the bottom. So I'm just going to move this, move this up slightly like this, so that you can see the. So now we're here. And then what we do is we just move, move certain things around. So this is a loop that concerns the variable n. It doesn't concern k. So we can move k in front of this summation, because this is, this is only a summation over n. So we can't move n past this summation, because that actually this summation is operating on n, but k, we can move here. So k is outside now. This x to the kth power also can move outside, because this summation doesn't concern the k. This one does. So we move k up here. Also, in a, in a similar way, we can move this n all the way to the back, like this. And then we can move this power of n all the way to the back to make it look like this. Now, this form. If everyone agrees that this has turned into this in, in, with very simple mathematical manipulation, no, no like advanced math involved here, binomial theorem, canceling, just redefining variables. So like a very basic undergraduate level math can give you this equation here. The significance of this is this term here um, being multiplied with Q because this is g, and we multiply q to g. If you multiply q to this term here, it's actually the definition of the multiple expansion. This is what a multiple expansion is. Multiple expansion is a power of uh, the distance between u and the center of the cell, which is j prime j, this vector here. It's a power of those. So multipole comes from the word. Um, so uh, the original terms are like monopole, dipole, quadrupole, and a plural uh, are having more than uh, one pole is you know where the word multipole comes from. It's like multipole. And so a monopole is when n is 0. When n is 0, it just turns into q, because you know the factorial of 0 is one and a power of zero makes this one. So this whole term turns into one, and you're multiplying by qj. So the, the monopole is the value itself. So the, this is actually a monopole, as you, if defined. And a dipole is when n is one. So if you put one here, this part is one, and then this part becomes a power of one. So it's just x. So without this thing, it's just x. So you multiply q 
by the vector x. So in 3D, it has components x, y, and z. So it's x times q, y times q, z times q. Our, those three values are called the dipole. So n equals 1 gives you the dipole. n equals 2, similarly, gives you the quadrupole. So these are called multipoles. That's why I wrote here m. So multiplying this by q gives you the multipole expansion. Now, in FMM, you have another side of the term, which you use for this side. So the multipole here turns into a local expansion here. So multiple expansion on this side turns into a local expansion on this side. What that calculation is doing is actually doing this part. It's taking this m and multiplying it to this gradient of the g function here. And if you sum all that up, you get something that's called a local expansion. So this term here gives you the local expansion. Once you get that, you multiply that to this part here, and then this gives you, since this is g and q you've multiplied in the beginning, this, it, once you're done with this whole thing, it actually gives you the u. So I'll, I'll show in the next picture uh, the actual correspondence between the original thing that we... Um, that I was describing, and how, how that is the monopole. Um, so what I've described in the first lecture this morning is actually something called a monopole. And so this, this uh, whole equation here can be turned into this one here. And so when you have uh, these terms, the accuracy is limited because there's nothing you can control. But we've shown here that this is a multiple and this whole term is the local expansion and this term here can be used. So now we apply that. We swap this thing, this thing, and this thing with each of these terms that we've shown here. This Maybe I should shift the picture up again so that you can see So now you can see everything. Um, so this one has turned into this, like I told you, this term being multiplied to Q is the definition of the multiple expansion. You do that for all the points inside uh, this, this part here. So you're summing for everything inside this box. And then the result you get, so because you have N uh, terms, I'm writing here m to the nth power. So when n is, m is 0, when m is 0, see what happens. This part becomes 1, this part becomes 1, so you get q. And then you're summing that over the domain, which is exactly this thing. So it, m0 was actually qj. So according to this mathematical definition, this was just calculating the first term of what we're going to do for many terms now. So you already were doing the first term. So you can think of this basic algorithm that we described as the, mo when the case when n is 0. So it's the same algorithm, but when it just ha so happens that when you put n equals 0, it turns into this one. In a very similar way, step 2 here is actually the case, so we write here this L part. It's the same equation I wrote here. You're multiplying by the M, so since we already have this in the form M, we can just use that M to calculate this part. So I'm just multiplying this by the M directly. And then the answer I'm writing as L. And this has, this is a function of K, because we have K terms here. And we're just summing over the n terms of the m for each term k in the L. So it's a double loop uh, of n and k. But we have this 
whole equation, if you think of it, when we say k is 0, and n, also n is 0, see what happens. This whole part, because these are 0, 0, and this, this is uh, 0 derivative means you don't take any derivative, so it's just g. This whole part becomes g. And then, because m, 0, was q prime j, this turns into the original thing, g times q pri qj prime. And this whole summation, because we're assuming that p is 0 and k is 0, so there's no summation here. So it, it just reduces to the original thing. So L0, now you see that it's equal to ui prime. So we were already calculating the first term, the 0, when, when n was 0 and k was 0 and p was 0. This reduces to the original form. Again, here, the last term. Now that we've calculated LK, we just use that, and we add it to the rest of the equation, which gives you, you know, the, the UI. So now UI can be expressed as this term. We have already calculated LK. And again, see what happens when P is 0 and L is 0. So L0 was UI, prime, and then these are zero, so these terms go away. And p is zero, so this summation goes away. So it's actually saying ui equals ui prime, because l zero is ui prime. So it was doing this exact same thing. So this form reduces to what we were doing. This is actually a first term of this expansion, the Taylor expansion. So we're simply increasing p and increasing k and increasing n here to get the rest of the terms. So it, we were just truncating early here. It wasn't something that was done artificially. We were actually correctly doing the first term of the more proper mathematical form that has higher order terms. So if you just want more terms, now you have to calculate this summation for n that is larger than 0, and a p and k that is larger than 0, and then this will become closer and closer. So this g will become closer and closer to the, the correct g value. Because as you increase the truncation order, p, to higher and higher numbers, this becomes a more and more accurate approximation. As long as xi prime j prime is larger than the sum of xi i prime plus xj prime j. That was the condition. That was the condition we, we um, saw earlier when we first introduced this. Uh, where did we introduce this? Here. So this was the condition for this Taylor expansion to converge to begin with. So this, it, as long as we have this, the accuracy is controllable to whatever we want. So by, by just simply increasing more terms here, and more terms here, and more terms here, we can get you know, infinitely accurate solutions um, if we can use high enough order arithmetic uh, operations. We, we can get you know, any, any accuracy, because we can just keep increasing the order of the Taylor expansion. So in short, this is just Taylor expansion. So multiple expansion and local expansion in the end. So th these abbreviations stand for particle to multiple, multiple to local. It's very clear from the naming and the correspondence between what you're doing. You're turning M into L, and then you're turning L into a particle information. So L to P. Uh, so you're actually doing a very simple Taylor expansion, uh, and that is at the heart of um, you know, the math in fast multiple methods. It was just Taylor expansion. And you were already doing the first term with this simple equation. Now uh, you can do any order expansion by doing this. So th this is just one level. So when you actually program this, now you are doing this between this blue box and red box, you do these three steps, P to M, M to L, and L to P, instead of doing this one, this one, and this one. 
So we'll do this gradually in the hands-on. We'll far first start with this one. But you can start from that same code and just change this into this, change this into this, change this into this, and the accuracy you will see that will automatically increase and will be controllable if you, you know, P will be a variable inside your code. You increase that from 0 to 1 to 2 and see how the accuracy increases. This is an interesting test that you can do. But mathematically, there's nothing too complicated about uh, fast multiple methods. Because when you, when you try to read about fast multiple methods, especially the 3D variants, uh, they, they first start from spherical harmonics. This, this is like more advanced math. But actually, all you had to know to understand the concept itself was Taylor expansion and, and maybe binomial theorem. So it wasn't very, you know, the, these spherical harmonics or complex numbers in 2D are used. But the, the basis is this. You, you can start from, this is probably the simplest way to understand at least the basics of, of why you can expand and, you know, what are the conditions for it to converge. So now we move to the multi-level case. So remember, um, we had a case where we have more than one level. We had to move from here to here to here to here to here to here. So how do we, how do, we do this intermediate step? We need to change a multiple expansion of these boxes into another multiple expansion for a bigger box. So to do that, we, we make a new decomposition into five vectors. So we originally had uh, three vectors that go from xj to xj prime to xi prime to xi. Now we have five vectors that go from j, j prime, j double prime, and then to i double prime, and then xi prime, and then xi. So this double i prime, double j prime are, you can think of the double primes as the previous i prime and j prime. They were at the center of the big box. But now we introduce this intermediate smaller one. And now we can rewrite that equation we had that defined the multiple and local expansions. Instead of using i prime and j prime, I'm using i double prime and double j prime. Uh, it's just switching uh, the prime with double primes. Starting from here, I can do the following. So now I decompose j double prime j to j double prime j prime j prime j. So it's just decomposing this vector into two components, this sum of these two arrows. By doing that, this mj double prime term here that I had, this one, is m x j double prime, this term here. This can be rewritten as, instead of j double prime j, I'm going to write it as j prime, j double prime, j prime, and j prime j. So it, these two. Again, when we have a power of something that's being added, we use binomial theorem. Again, so now it becomes this combination thing with the summation from k to 0 to n, and then these two powers of these two terms. Just simple binomial theorem. And then this, again, we cancel the n prime, and then we get this thing. If we look at this thing closely, what is this doing? This is turning a multiple expansion at j prime into a multiple expansion at j double prime. This is what we wanted to do. We wanted to turn this multiple expansion here into a multiple expansion for the bigger box. Now we have this, because, because this, this definition by definition, qj times this kj j prime j to the, to the kth power. This is, oh, and, and taking this k uh, factorial here. By taking these three things, we can make it, we can call that mk. This is a multiple expansion for j, j prime. No. And now, similarly, we take this side, decompose xi, i double prime into x i i prime i prime i double prime this thing and then now the u i term this this part that we had for um, this term here this one turns into the sum of these two vectors which again if we use the binomial theorem
turns into something that looks like this. Okay, yeah. So we we already canceled the uh, k prime term. So it, it did it in one step. And now we have this thing here. We Again, we swap the order of the n summation with the k summation. We swap the two again. The same thing we did before for the um, multiple to local part. And then with this term, so this will be equal to this if ln was this thing here. So if we, if we make this whole term look like this shape, which is what we want it to turn into, we want it to become this, then ln is equal to all these parts here, which is, which is this thing here. So now, what, what is this? This is a way to turn the local expansion at xi double prime into local expansions at i prime, these small ones. So now we have what we want. We have a way to turn this into this, this into this, this into this, this into this, this into this. So now if we make that into, we swap that, we have this and this and this and this and this. Now we have the full hierarchical, all five components, P to M, M to M, M to L, L to L, L to P, all these kernels we can do. And again, all we used was like binomial theorem and you know swapping loop orders. So it wasn't anything complicated. And now we can describe the full FMM calculation. And basically now you can code FMM. Uh, if if you can code the tree structure to manipulate these, um, you know, cells uh, properly. But the the mathematical part, you understand now. Uh, the the remaining thing that might be complicated is how to calculate this derivative, the high order derivative of the g function here. That that may be the only difficult thing to do because these are basically factorials, multiplications, taking the power. The, these you can do very simply inside the program. The only difficult thing remaining that you have to do is this thing. But uh, there is a mathematical formula uh, that creates a recurrence relation to calculate higher order derivative terms of G. So, so I'll explain that to you uh, maybe tomorrow when we actually try to code this thing. Uh, but today you don't need to worry about this. Just, just understand where it comes from. This G using Taylor expansion turns into this long form where it has the multiple expansion and then local expansion which gives you the end result and you can by using binomial theorem you can construct operators that turn multiple expansion of smaller boxes to larger boxes and local expansions of larger boxes into smaller boxes so all, with, with all these operations the only complicated one is probably this part here. Okay, so now you have the multi-level um, equations. So this is the entire flow of calculation. For the whole FMM, now you understand the math somewhat. So it's easy for you to grasp the picture now, I think, in a very concrete way. So first you have all the particles. These are your sources. You want to calculate the effect of all these points onto all the other points. So first, what you do is, for all boxes, so first you divide the tree into smaller and smaller boxes recursively. This is what you do first. You divide the domain, you cut it in half, and then half, and then half. And then at the bottom, if you reach a constant number of points, you can set a criteria. Like if um, one box contains less than 32 points, I stop dividing. If you do that, then you'll, you'll reach a bottom of the tree like this. Then at the bottom, for each smallest box in the tree, you do this calculation here. So everything inside there needs to be summed according to you know, these, these fact factorials and powers of x. Uh, between the distance between, so 
j prime in this case is the center of your box, and j is all the points inside that box. So this vec this vector should be small. This number should be at, at most the distance from the center to the corner of your box. And then you just sum that up for everything. Okay, so th this is like a, you know, a whole view of the whole calculation. You don't just handle one box against one box in this case. You want to handle everything here. So you, you preemptively sort of calculate everything because eventually someone is going to use your multiple expansion. So why wait until it's being used? You can just calculate all the multiple expansions because you know someone will use it in the future. So you, you calculate everything for all of them. And then, in a similar way, you go up one level. What you do is you take the center of the small box, and then you want to calculate the multiple expansion at the big box using all the small box centers, or the multiple expansions at the center of the small boxes. And so you do the, this calculation that we derived using the binomial theorem. You use this thing to calculate the multiple expansion at the large boxes. If you have a deep tree, you keep doing this, going up the tree, up the tree, up the tree, and you do this over and over again. So if, you, if you're in 2D, you have always four boxes to sum up. If you have 3D, you have eight boxes to always sum up. Um, if the points, so say that these particle distributions are not uniform and you have a big hole here. In that case, this number won't always be four or eight. Some, some boxes will be empty. So as you go up the tree, you'll have cases where this sum is like 7 or 6 or you know, even 1 in some cases. So uh, you, you do this anyway. It's the same calculation, even if there's empty space. You just keep doing this calculation going up and up the tree. Once you reach the top, you have all the multiple expansions, m, at all levels and all boxes in the tree. So your, your tree is full of multiple expansions now. You have a full tree, tree full of multiple expansions. With that information, what you can do is, at, at the high level, you can calculate the local expansion of this big box using the big multiple expansions that you have at this level. Going down one level, you've created the multiple expansions for all of these boxes. But you don't use these ones. You've calculated this, these ones out here, but you've already calculated the effect of this gray part at this higher level. So you don't need to calculate the same thing, same effect twice. So you skip this part, skip the white parts. You only use these red boxes to calculate the effect of this blue one. Now, of course, if your blue box is somewhere else, then uh, you might use these. So it's not like you've wasted these multiple expansions. Someone will use them. It's just not this blue box. This blue box will only use these red boxes. And then you do this blue box for, so this blue point needs to loop over all these boxes. And then for each blue box, you need to find the appropriate red boxes to interact with. Same here. For each blue box in this whole domain, you need to do the same calculation that is shown here. So it's not just this one blue box. It's just in this picture, I'm just showing one blue box. But you do this for all the boxes. And then here, at the bottom level, there is always a white part that remains uh, where you can't approximate using this equation here. There, you use the original equation and just directly call the particle-to-particle -particle interaction. And then you get the part of the solution directly for ui. And you keep summing to ui, the effect of here. And then you need to sum to the effect of ui that was given here, you need to sum it with the effect of this and this. So how do you get the information from these large boxes? You just cascade down the information. So the information from this big box goes down to this smaller box. And then this goes down to a smaller box here. And it gets summed to the information that was calculated here. So as you're going down, you need to keep summing with the other effects. So this blue box turns into this blue box here, and then this blue box gets summed to that effect. And then this is all being done by the local expansion being uh, transferred to the center of the big, from the bigger box to the smaller box. Bigger box to smaller box to smaller box. And then finally, when you're at the bottom level, 
you need to change this local expansion at the center of the smallest box to actual particle information. So then you just calculate this equation here and then sum it to the UI at each individual particle. And then that gets added to the effect that you calculated here. So it, you, you can't, you, you need to actually sum, by, by doing the summation of this guy with this guy, you're actually summing this gray part effect to this, the effect of this gray part to the effect of this gray part. You're summing everything up. So uh, in the end, if you do all these calculations correctly for all the blue particles, not just the ones shown here, but for all the boxes, all the blue particles in all the boxes, then you will get the calculation of everything against everything. And your calculation would look, your, your data dependency would look like this. So it goes from up the tree, and then at this level, the yellow boxes interact somewhat with each other, crosses over, and then goes down the tree. And then in the background, you sort of have, for the near boxes, you have a direct calculation against points against points. So this is shown in the gray lines. So that, that's the, this gray part here. So you, you sort of have uh, six different equations to calculate. One, two, three, four, five, six. And for different combinations of boxes. But um, programming-wise, uh, all you need to do for all of these calculations is first find the box which interacts. So, so for this one, you need to find which box and then which particle is inside that box. For this one, you need to find this box and which are its children boxes. For this one, you need to find, for all the boxes, you need to find these gray boxes. Uh, actually, finding these gray boxes is the most difficult part uh, in, for, for finding the boxes. Now, going down the tree, you just need to find your children boxes and move the information down. And at the bottom, you just need to find, again, all the particles that belong to your box. So uh, mathematically, you need a way to calculate all these equations. The most difficult part being probably to calculate this uh, gradient of the G function here. Um, but sort of a, uh, programming wise, you need the, the most difficult part might be how to calculate uh, the, these gray or how to determine these gray boxes, how, how to sort of grab that information from, you know. You, so you need to have some scheme for identifying far boxes. So I'll describe that in tomorrow's lecture. So tomorrow will be on um, tree construction and interaction list finding. So the, these, these gray, the list of these gray boxes is called an interaction list because it's a list of boxes that interact with each other. So construction of the interaction list is also uh, a critical part of an FMM algorithm. But I, I will cover that tomorrow. So today, you just have to remember, FMM consists of, this is the whole picture. You, you now see from uh, a sort of a high um, view, a high order uh, view, how you can increase the accuracy using these expansions, by increasing the expansion order. And you just need to construct a tree structure so that you can hierarchically sum all the multiple expansion information, calculate the local expansion from the interaction lists, and then cascade down the local expansions, and at the bottom, calculate the potential from the local expansions. So this is, this is the whole picture of the FMM. Uh, and I think, is this my last, no, this, this, I think this was my, this is my last slide. So, uh, now, I'm going to give you uh, some timing results for an actual run. When you actually run this, so you have the P2P kernel, P2M, M2M, M2L. So say that you run all these things and you increase n, the number of particles, so you start from like a uh, very small number and you go to like 10 million. This is 10 times 10 to the 6, so it's like 10 million particles. And then 
Uh, this is a very old result, so it's taking a very long time. Uh, not, now I can do this in like a few seconds. But just for the purpose of explaining, it doesn't make a difference what the absolute value here is. What's important is the color. You see that this M2L that's shown here, this part, or either this part, or it's usually at the bottom level. You have many blue boxes that need to interact with all these red boxes. So the M2L calculation at the bottom level is usually the most expensive part, which is shown in this yellow. But it's not always the most expensive part. So say you're, you had uh, 40, uh, 4 million points. Actually, the yellow part is rather small. It's, it's this P2P part that's big. So th think about why this is. So why, why for some n is this part big? And why for some n is this part big? So this is the key to understanding how to make this calculation order n. If you draw order n line, although this is wavy, the order n straight line will fall, uh, you know, it, it will follow the order n line. So um, what, what's the key here? So first, the first thing to know is this P2P, when you increase n, the number of particles, without changing the level of the tree, what happens? The number of particles per box increases. When the number of particles per, per, per leaf box, let's call the um, boxes at the bottom of the tree, the leaf boxes, because the, the limbs of the, the tree are leaves. So at, when, when the number of particles per leaf box grows, then this calculation, since it's an n squared calculation, grows as n squared. So you see this, this will you know, um, form a parabolic line, like an n squared, or like a, you know, if you draw y equals x squared line, that's what it would look like. Because it's growing as n squared, it will keep growing uh, quadratically. And then, um, so at some point, it becomes beneficial to divide the tree. But if you, if you divide the tree too soon, what happens when you divide the tree one level? Actually, since one box splits into, in 3D, eight boxes, in 2D it splits into four boxes, since it splits into eight boxes in 3D, the number of M2L calculation suddenly jumps eight times. So this, this is what's happening here. The, the yellow part, um, say that this was at level six, and then you suddenly increase to level seven. The number of M2L calculations for that one level down, there, there are eight times more uh, blue boxes to calculate for. The, the number of red boxes that interact with each blue box doesn't change. It's just that the number of blue boxes that you need to loop over in the whole you know, bottom level, because you'll have eight times more boxes in the bottom level. You'll, you'll have eight times more boxes to calculate. So this yellow part increases eight times. It just goes like this. But the P2P decreases because you'll divide because you'll divide this into smaller boxes, actually the size of each box will shrink in, in, into like one eighth in 3D. And the number of particles inside them will shrink one eighth. So if you follow this blue line, it would have gone you know, quadratically to like here, but it increases one eighth to down here. So this, this balance between increasing this one uh, eight times and decreasing this one eighth has to happen at the right timing because the, the P2P is increasing n squared, but this one is only increasing order, order n. Uh, no, this one is not increasing. It's, it's constant if you don't change the level. So the yellow part, unless you divide the tree, remains constant, but the blue part keeps growing n squared. So at some point, you need to change, but then the yellow part increases eight times and the blue part uh, decreases one eighth. So if you do this at the wrong timing, so say that you, you switched this level and the yellow part increased this much over here, you, you, the timing would still be like this big. So you'll have a huge jump in the timing. Or 
in the other case, if you didn't divide the tree early enough, this part will keep increasing. So the blue part will become so big, and the yellow part will remain the same. So you'll have like a very thin yellow line and a very, very big blue line. So the, the key to achieving order n in fast multiple methods is to subdivide the tree at the right time. And how you achieve that is usually um, assigning a constant number, you know, like a threshold. So say that if the number of particles at the leaf box um, becomes more than 32, subdivide. And then as long as that number 32 is correct, it will subdivide every time that number increases past 32, it will subdivide. And then it, it gets um, subdivided into one-eighth, so you'll have four particles on average per box. And then that four keeps growing, like four, 10, 11, you know, up to 32 again. Once it passes 32, then it gets subdivided uh, one to, you know, to four again. So if you, if you write in your code uh, uh, a if statement that says if the number of particles per leaf box uh, exceeds a certain value, then subdivide. As long as you have that, this switch should happen automatically. You don't need to manually program in your code the correspondence between n and the number of levels. You don't need to write such a thing. If you, all you need to do is keep, you know, uh, like a threshold for how many number of points you want per leaf box. That's, that's one number that you need to assign to the code, and then this subdivision will happen at the right timing automatically. So um, that, that's sort of uh, the timing balance. You, you can see from this picture also that M to M, L to L, L to P, P to M, these other parts, um, you, you don't really see the colors in this plot. They're, they're very small, actually. The, the majority is either in P to P or the M to L at the bottom level. That's, that's usually the most significant parts of the FMM calculation. So you, when, when you want to optimize your code, keep that in mind because optimizing this part or this part of your code doesn't really give you any speed up because it's not taking any time, as you can see in these plots. There's no orange or red part. Well, there, it's very small. You can barely see it. Okay, so I think uh, we are done with the lecture part. Uh, and we'll have another 10-minute break, and then we will start the hands-on session, so actual coding. Uh, how, does everyone have a laptop? Everyone has some environment to program. And I think you will be logging into some server somewhere. Uh, OK, so yeah, I, I will be showing in the hands-on session, I'll show on this screen my, um, my terminal so that you, you, you can actually see uh, my, what I am coding. So yeah, I'll do the hands-on session like this. So I will write code here um, while trying to, so this is like a live coding session for me starting from, from this one. So we will try to code this, this one starting from here. And uh, I, I think some people are very advanced, but some people are still beginners in, in writing um, code. So uh, I will write in C language. You, you can write in whatever language you want. But if you're not too sure and if you just want to you know, um, copy what I'm doing, then you can also write in C. Uh, and I will try to do this in very small steps. So very slowly, um, I will show you how, well, maybe in the beginning, I should show how to set up the environment and make sure everyone is able to run something. Um, so, but this, I think, is a very good place to start because it's very simple. It's probably going to be a few tens of lines of code anyway. And it actually gives you the chance to confirm that it's correct. So you, if you have a bug in your code, you'll know because the answer will be totally wrong. So 
Um, I'll, I'll go around, you know, confirming that everyone has a working version of this one before I move on to further ones. Because everything starts from here. And as I've, as I've explained in the lectures, uh, this is already a good first approximation for FMM. Everything else from here is incremental. So you can change your code gradually um, and, and you know, keep saving if it works so that you don't break anything. Um, OK, so should we have a 10-minute break before? OK, so we'll, we will start the hands-on session from 11.25. OK, thank you.